it's a big business. We're a $3.6 billion business. So it's a bit different than where we came from. But uh, we produce 50,000 turbos a day, would you believe? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you design a fuel cell vehicle, you, you design it as either a fuel cell dominant vehicle or a range extended. Uh, vehicle mm. or or something in the middle yeah so a fuel cell dominant vehicle most of the power that the vehicle needs will be coming directly live from the fuel cell so it will go through many many cycles yeah whereas you go for a range extended vehicle then you probably take it carrying more battery with you the range extended fuel cell is on virtually all the time, mm -hmm. just as a generator. And it's constantly charging the batteries, as it were. So you, you have choices, and uh, constructors are making those choices every day as to what USPs they want to sell in their particular vehicles. You have to really go away from just a vehicle observation, and you have to start thinking of, of its full cycle from mm -hmm. really from cradle to grave. Not just the industry, but also customers need to be made made uh, very well aware of that uh, of those facts because uh, then their purchase decisions uh, might be uh, influenced by them as well. So that's no, I, th a huge, huge I think challenge. everybody needs to be well informed and. Yes. Uh, yeah, the headlines don't always carry the full story. Hello and welcome everybody uh, on the other end of the cameras. And this is a very special episode of Behind the Blueprint. I have a lot of people here around uh, in the studio around me. Uh, David is next to me. He's uh, a usual face in the podcast. Hello, everyone. It's a very special first occasion for sure. Exactly, because as you can hear, we are speaking in a completely different language than, than previously. Uh, we have switched over to English because we have uh, two special guests uh, from Garrett uh, here. Uh, Peter Davies, um, who is the director of Powertrain, uh, and uh, Nathaniel Bontam, uh, who is the Powertrain leader uh, for fuel cell compressors. Gentlemen, welcome to the studio. Well, thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, well, I hope that we're going to have a, a really good conversation. I know that you are very, very experienced on the topic that, that we have at hand. We just hope that we can maintain this uh, <laughs> momentum here uh, at our end. Well, we just get enough practice doing podcasts in English. And right now we are switching to English, which is going to be a completely different challenge for sure. So exactly. I hope we are going to be fun enough to to be heard. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I hope that the topic itself will compensate if, uh, <laughs> uh, for, for our moderating uh, challenges. Before we go very deep, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about yourselves, how you ended up at Garrett and, and what you're doing in your, in your current roles at the company? Uh, that would be probably a good context to, uh, to, the, to the audience. Sure. Okay, I'll start. So I graduated university a long time ago. 1985 <laughs> was my uh, last set of universe, uh, undergraduate days. Um, but I came through the engine industry and uh, after two or three different uh, companies, uh, I, uh, I arrived at Garrett and I've been at Garrett for 28 years. It's been a wonderful journey. I started in the UK and in the last um, 20 years, I've actually been working in France. So I'm now both UK citizen and French citizen. And um, it's been a wonderful journey. The company's done nothing but grow uh, while I've been there. And uh, I learned something new about turbocharging and uh, boosting every day of my life. So it's, it's a fascinating topic. You moved to France because of Garrett? Or uh, I, d I did. I mean, uh, to be honest, it just came together. There was a professional opportunity and the uh, family circumstances were perfect. Uh, second child had just arrived. So uh, we decided to go on an adventure and uh, it's been a great one. That's fantastic to hear. Nathaniel, how about you? Yes, yeah, so Nathaniel Bonton, I'm a French, as you may hear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm graduating from a French engineering school, Ecole Centrale de Nantes, based in the west of France. Uh, I have been graduate, graduated in 98, uh, quite a long time ago, 25 mm -hmm. years ago. And then I did specialize in uh, internal combustion engine studies in, uh, in Paris. Uh, after that, I joined, I joined uh, uh, Stellantis yes, at yeah. that time as a, as a uh, commission pre-development engineer in motorsport application in rallying for 14 years. 
That must that was an exciting time for to, to was, be, be at, a, super, at a company like that. I was super excited, but for different and personal reasons, <laughs> I decided to leave to join Garrett uh, eight years ago in uh, in uh, 2014, the first of April, which is not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if it is, then it's a serious one. Sorry. <laughs> if it's a joke, then it's a serious <laughs> one. Yes, yes, yes. It was a serious. It is still a serious one. Yes. <laughs> uh, first, uh, I started as a as a production engineer for. Pre-dev applications on uh, using um, gasoline mineralization, using uh, gasoline VNT application that was becoming a, a long story for, for, for mm -hmm. Garrett, uh, for what we know today. Uh, and then uh, uh, over the last years, I switched progressively on fuel cell activities and I'm full-time uh, uh, leading fuel cell activities uh, over the last 12 months, I would yeah. say with uh, mainly non-automotive applications, with uh, multiple different uh, uh, applications that we list later on, like rail, uh, 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 marine application, uh, everything that you could meet using a, a fuel cell stack and a fuel cell uh, system. Yeah, that's pretty amazing, and I think this is a fantastic leeway and a, and a good glimpse into the topic at hand, which we have ne we haven't yet mentioned. But uh, but I think your 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 um, sort of uh, job description or or, or the de description of your activities has hinted uh, upon the fact that we are going to be talking about uh, hydrogen applications and uh, um, especially how um, Garrett is focusing on uh, on different areas uh, of development in this uh, in this topic. Uh, I must say that I was very surprised when uh, when we talked about this uh, for the first time because. The <laughs> I drive a turbocharged car myself, and uh, Garrett's name has been connected with uh, with turbocharged internal combustion engines uh, uh, for me for years. Um, how did the the H two uh, segment or business business field uh, come into play uh, at Garrett, and and how did this? Uh, Before we up? dive in, can you put us in a context that how big player Garrett is on a on the turbocharger market? Yeah, sure. So, um, of course, we would argue that we're number one. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I think it's, it's true. We're the leader in the technology of turbocharging for uh, internal combustion engines. Um, we're a very big industrial company. I mean, we come from very humble beginnings. The, the company actually bears the name of the founder. Uh, the gentleman called Cliff Garrett, who founded it in the 1930s. And in the 1950s, um, we actually started to uh, produce turbochargers. So our first client was Caterpillar. And there's a really? famous letter between the d then CEO of Caterpillar and Cliff Garrett saying, let's get going. And uh, <laughs> this is where... Well, in that, in that sense, uh, the turbocharger definitely helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this was in the days of mechanization of the big industrial projects like the Hoover mm -hmm. Dam and things like this in the US. And uh, they really needed power density. Uh, yeah. from, their, from their then diesel engines. So it all started in large engines. It slowly progressed into passenger car engines and into truck engines. And now 100% of the world's truck engines have turbochargers in. 100% of the world's passenger car diesels have turbochargers. Well, quasi 100%. Well, at least of the new cars. I, and, I can't uh, recall anyone with a naturally aspirated probably diesel. Probably north of 50% of the world's gasoline cars now Definitely. have, have uh, turbos as well. So, I mean, it's a big business. We're a $3.6 billion business. So it's a bit different than where we came from. Um, but uh, we produce 50,000 turbos a day, would you believe? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean... If we count 100% of the diesels and 50% of the gas uh, passenger cars uh, on their own, that's that's already uh, yeah. a huge volume yeah. so, uh, to so serve. Th the, the world automotive market is normally recognized as being somewhere in around 90 million vehicles yep. or units a year. And uh, the, the business is divided uh, between certain competition and we are the, the leading turbocharger. Um, supplier, so hence why we make fifty thousand units a day in in factories all over the world. Well, that's Just those those kind of numbers. I think are are yeah. very useful to hear. That would mm -hmm. be my second question: that how dependent you are on the European market, or how much worldwide the company so is. So uh, Europe is approximately fifty percent of our business. Um, there's material out there where people can uh, find those figures, um, but uh, Asia and the Americas um, play a huge role as well. So those are the 
uh, two regions where the majority of the world's vehicles are, are built. Obviously, they're exactly. used over, all over the world, but they're primarily they're built in uh, the Americas, including uh, South America, or uh, Europe, uh, Japan, China, Korea, uh, and of course, uh, increasingly so, India. Exactly. Well, yeah, definitely. Um, but it's it's still surprising to me that fifty percent of your uh, of your market is is, is Europe because uh, Europe is. I mean, at least from a passenger car mm -hmm. uh, sales standpoint, is uh, sort of stepping a little bit back and back on the uh, on the ladder. Uh, but um, I guess this is still a um, well, very I think relevant. We, we, we think still have some historical numbers in uh, in Europe, especially when you consider that really a hundred percent of diesel is. Yeah. It's boosted. Definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. And more and more the petrol engine cars as well. More and more. Uh, I mean, it's, I, especially I, European manufacturers. Actually, that's a super interesting point <laughs> because um, while the number of diesels in, in Europe may be falling, the number of uh, gasoline um, uh, turbocharged vehicles is actually increasing. So the, uh, we, we actually are increasing our... Uh, Uh, gasoline turbocharger sales all the time. And we also have to keep in mind that Volkswagen, Stellantis, Renault Nissan are the, among the five biggest players and they are based in Europe also. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and their their petrol uh, activities, I mean, their, their gasoline engines are almost exclusively yeah. uh, turbocharged as far as I yeah. know. Yeah, but if we are staying in Europe, then in the mid-term or the uh, long-term, the gasoline engines are definitely going to <laughs> decline. So how Karat is preparing for that? Okay, well, um, some of the things that we're preparing we're not really in a position to talk about today, but we're, we're here to talk about hydrogen, so that's mm. one of the big <laughs> topics. Yeah, And um, we, we, can, uh, we can talk about uh, hydrogen fuel cell. Uh, we can talk about um, hydrogen for internal combustion engine as well. Um, hydrogen's going to play a huge role in the um, in the energy transition yeah in the meantime i'm uh, messing up the slides a little <laughs> bit uh, apologies for that but uh, yes i think uh, here we, we we covered uh the uh the portfolio of garrett and uh, and um, the volumes that we are uh, we are we are speaking about uh yeah i mean um These slides are going to be cut into the video anyway. These contain uh, sort of the key numbers sure. of the um, of the company. Um, And as you see, 16, the more than 1,600 patents issued. That is, yeah. I uh, mean, that's from day one, but uh, it's, yes, but it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's, it's still a, it's a huge intellectual port portfolio that we have. Well, the turbocharger market is definitely a niche market, and. You need to have very specialized te technology. It's too. a very competitive market, and uh, to one of the things that Nathaniel and I are working on because we're in advanced engineering pro programs is when we have an idea, we must get to a, a patent disclosure uh, as soon as possible because it's because it somebody else will jump on it. If yes, or or, <laughs> or, or they jumped 20 years ago, <laughs> just <laughs> nobody noticed. <laughs> This yeah. patenting thing can have interesting aspects for sure. Absolutely. Uh, had we checked this slide, David, then this would have answered your uh, your question yeah, uh, previously. Uh, it's uh, it shows uh, the activities of uh, of Garrett uh, globally, and I think that there is not really a um, an edge of the globe that uh, that is not covered yeah. by uh, by the activities. So, so maybe I should point out it all started over there in Torrance, California, near Los Angeles. Okay. Um, head office is now uh, Roll in Switzerland. Uh, Although we're we're quoted on the U.S. stock exchange and on the Nasdaq, so we're, we're an American company. Interesting constellation, but yeah, really cool. And Nathaniel and I, we come from town of Auch, uh, which the name's somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. Yes, but it's actually in France. So it's <laughs> the lines leading to France, quite close to the uh, to the HQ, um, yeah. as I can see. And now we don't have any facilities here in Hungary. Um, but the closest Garrett facility, uh, well, there's kind of two of them, is Preshov in Slovakia. We have one of our uh, most modern uh, manufacturing facilities yeah. in Preshov. And in Brno, Czech Republic, we have our single largest uh, technical center. So, so that's, that includes development and, and yeah. testing and everything. <coughs> exactly. There, there is no plant over there. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's, that's, yeah. that's purely, purely development. And there is also Bukarest, which, which is not very far from here. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Bucharest is another one of our uh, plants, and in indeed a lot of the 
core competencies of the business side of our business are in Bucharest. Yeah, very nice. Well, that's uh, it's always interesting to see how the uh, um, responsibilities are uh, are dealt with in, mm-hmm. in in such a uh, large and globalized company. Very cool. Um, t- so I think we should sort of leave way back into uh, yeah. towards uh, hydrogen. Let's uh, do that because that definitely is uh, a big interest of ours. And uh, and in actually one of our previous episodes that was uh, in Hungarian, we have uh, we have already touched upon the use of hung- uh, of hydrogen um, in as an energy source uh, in transportation. How has it become so relevant and and um, I mean, maybe if if I put that into a little bit of a context when when uh, uh, speaking of this question, uh, there has been um, experiment. There have been experimental vehicles for quite a lar- uh, long time now uh, with uh, fuel cells. Some applications have found their mm-hmm. their way onto the streets as well. Uh, but what stops really its its widespread use? There's different aspects of this. For you have to have the vehicles, you have uh, you have to have the inter- infrastructure, and you have to have the fuel. <laughs> so with, without the whole supply chain, it doesn't work. Yeah. So um, we are getting to the stage where we've got uh, a lot of demonstration vehicles out there, and, we, and we've got a lot of vehicles which are uh, quite high in cost to manufacture. But now we get into automotive scale, and now we're bringing the cost down so that it becomes a technology which is affordable. But at the same time, uh, the legislation has to be in place so that the fuel is going to be at the fuel stations. <laughs> and the people who are producing the fuel uh, through electrolysis, through abated um, green energy, which uh, which is coming from either wind farms or f- from solar farms, um, they have to have all of that electrolysis in place to actually produce the fuel. And it's only then when you get the distribution network in place that uh, manufacturers will really be secure with their business models to um, uh, to deploy the vehicles into the field. And that is the stage we're at now. We're at the tipping point where this will happen now in the next five years. It will be interesting to see, definitely. Because in all of those areas or... Or just in the vehicle technology. Because so you the, three the, the vehicles are essentially ready to go. I mean, we we have launches now in twenty four, in twenty five, in twenty six. Mm-hmm. So the v- vehicles will come available. The fueling stations have to be there, mm-hmm. and there's legislation in place across European Union now, twenty seven plus the UK, uh, to make sure that there'll be hydrogen fuel on the highways by law by 2028 so well and then there's another set of incentives being put in place in order to make sure that uh, people are actually using electro electrolysis to generate the hydrogen because it, let's face it it's not for free exactly that, that's it, yeah. it, it may be the most abundant element yeah. but you have to do a bit of work to get it into a state where you can use it and the, and that bit of work on industrial scale is uh a pretty huge challenge, as as far as I understand so far, and uh, yes, <laughs> it's uh, it's not going to be uh, quite so simple. And uh, you know, we 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 talk about twenty million tons of uh, hydrogen per year, but if you compare it to the amount of oil we burn today, it's still a drop in the ocean. So uh, <laughs> that twenty million is the current uh, no, number, or that's no, that's, it's a, a that's a target number for twenty thirty. Okay. So uh, that's what. The electrolysis industry has signed up for uh, this year, in fact. Uh, well, maybe the end of 22. But uh, uh, they now have uh, agreed targets. So slowly the European Union is put in the supply chase chain in, in place. That actually makes sense that it's it's built up sort of... Because it's 23 now, when we think of uh, this number to 2030, uh, that gives a exactly one model cycle of time for the for the manufacturers to sort of exactly. respond to that uh, yeah. with, with mature technologies that mm-hmm. they can bring to the market. And do you have any insight that how the transportation or storage issues around hydrogen are planned to be solved? That you mentioned that uh, it will be mandatory to, to sell hydrogen on beside highways, but... So the a lot of the hydrogen is going to be produced close to wind farms, um, which... Mm-hmm. Some of them are going to be in the North Sea. So one of the first 
places the infrastructure goes in is around the ports, uh, cities of Rotterdam and Hamburg and places like this. And then from there you get uh, pipelines being dedicated to hydrogen, uh, taking it away from the coast and taking it to industrial areas or to storage facilities. And hydrogen is actually not that difficult to store. You can store it overground or you can store it in salt caverns underground. So you can have perfectly... In gaseous or liquid? Uh, in, it's in, in gaseous form. In, in gaseous yeah. form, yeah. So you, pu wow. you pump it into the ground and if you've got a good um, so you can rock, actually rock structure of salt, <laughs> it, it actually seals. So you can yeah. use natural tanks to store? I'm sorry? You can use natural tanks which are already yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. No, a salt cavern is essentially a natural silo, yeah? Yeah, interesting. And to answer to your question, liquid hydrogen, that's also possible. We are starting to see that with some customers. Uh, Deborah, mm -hmm. I think they, yeah. did, uh, they did talk about that. But the main problem with the liquid hydrogen is the temperature that you have to... Yeah. That's what I was getting to, at. To, yeah. to keep that minus and to cool as well. three, if I remember exactly. well. Exactly. Which is the main issue with, uh, with, uh, with the liquid hydrogen. But in terms of power density right. for sure that would yeah be of, best. Course, of course mm. of course of yeah. course as far as i know uh, i mean i'm not really very very well versed in the uh, in the hydrogen uh, uh, vehicles that are on sale today of the few that are uh, available but as far as i know they also store hydrogen uh, on board uh, liquefied Strand, yes uh, mainly gas gases or or is it ga gas yeah at no. two two standard pressures at the moment 250 okay. bars or 700 okay. bars uh, everything is moving towards 700, of course, for the higher range of the yeah. vehicle that you are using. Mm -hmm. But liquid hydrogen is also something that all of the customers are investigating at the moment. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there the, the energy balance of the uh, of the whole equation is going to be a bigger question yeah, because, yeah. I mean, cooling these um, vast uh, amounts of, uh, of gas down to, to that, those really, really low temperatures, mm -hmm. that's uh, definitely something that hurts the, uh, the viability of the, uh, of the equation. Well, now we we talked a little bit about uh, storing and and the and attract attractivity of uh, of hydrogen, mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are really two ways that have been forming um, in the past uh, of of using it for mobility. Indeed. One is the fuel cell, and uh, one is uh, ICE. For me, it's interesting to see that these these kind of technologies have 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 formed. Um, what was really uh, first and then where did it, where did the whole uh, usage of, of, of hydrogen uh, start uh, at? <coughs> so historically I think uh, it's it's quite clear the fuel cell was first <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we we can go back 150 years um, even a little bit further to the very first uh, fuel cell the first one was complete accident uh, the gentleman uh, electrocuted himself not not badly <laughs> <laughs> okay that's good that, that, <laughs> but, but but he didn't mean to do what he was doing internal combustion yeah. engine got popularity uh, <laughs> <laughs> um uh, but the the gentleman who really put the first one together and it was the world's first uh, fuel cell um was a gentleman called uh mr grove okay. um and uh, was was actually British, but uh, uh, with that, that <laughs> that's my <laughs> my only link to it. Very fine. It's, uh, one of my professors always highlights every Hungarian uh, <laughs> connection, because, of which there are fortunately many in uh, in science. So that's uh, yeah. feel free to do so. No, but that got, so um, he was around in the eighteen hundreds. Um, credited with the first fuel cell in eighteen forty two. Um, Actually, another British guy. I'll do. I'll do it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> um, later in the uh, 20th century, uh, he was credited with him having the first practical and the first uh, kilowatt um, size fuel cell, and uh, it was that fuel cell that actually took the Americans to the moon in the Apollo program. So that they only had five kilowatts of electricity to uh, to operate the uh, module with, and we all know what happened on. Apollo 13, yeah. <laughs> uh, they lost their oxygen supply, which in the end was the big problem because they had no electricity in, yeah. inside the capsule. Yeah. So, um, But this is where the first applications were, and since then, of course, it's come a long way. And to put it on the road in a, in a regular passenger car or a truck, uh, it's going to be a huge achievement uh, uh, for the whole industry. 
yeah, unfortunately, five kilowatts is not going to be quite enough. It uh, would not cut it, no. <laughs> <laughs> for, for all customer requirements. Yeah. And how it comes that uh, the fuel cell technology and the internal combustion and, uh, technology can competing in terms of using hydrogen as a fuel? They, c- they can both um, be competitive, um, but they do different things, if we're perfectly honest. Um, the fuel cell is uh, very efficient uh, when it's operating on part load. Um, much more efficient than an internal combustion on part load. So arguably on certain road applications, that's a really good idea. Um, actually, when they run at um, full load, uh, so rated power, they're, they're pretty close to each other. So the, uh, the fuel cell has a curve where it's good at part load and then it uh, reduces a little bit uh, mm-hmm. towards rated power. Um, but uh, so... Applications like agricultural machinery um, operates on high load a lot of the time, and it's you you can't take a cable to these machines. <laughs> yeah, the fu- would be difficult. You, c- you can take the fuel to them, but you can't really take a cable to them. So, this is this is one of the reg- uh, areas where they're going to be really useful. And how do you see competing fuel cell technology with battery electric vehicles? I think they're complementary. Um, just like one t-shirt doesn't fit all um, it's uh, it's the same for powertrains um, this is I think a really important message to ba- battery uh, to electric is really good for some things and it's not the answer for other things so I think you have a chart for I, this I think as we well. have a chart there if, uh, if we can find it yeah. this one uh, yeah. right here with so the uh, various different Vehicle classes on the so uh, on the graph. Some things that batteries do very well uh, is light duty, low kilometers per day. Yep. Things yeah. that they would really struggle to do is um, things that are working twenty four seven, or already extremely heavy. <laughs> 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 and somewhere in the middle, there's a there's a borderline where you can make a case for honestly for either and depending on how fast the technology progresses on one or the other uh, you m- you may find that uh, one wins over our first um, fuel s- adventure into fuel cells was 2016 it was in the uh, saloon car um, segment um, we actually provided the um, uh, the fuel cell compressor um, for the Honda Clarity uh, vehicle that was launched in 2016 so we were down there in the light duty uh, relatively low mileage um, per day. Many of the projects we deal with today are more towards the uh, right hand side and the upper part of the chart, uh, but uh, we're still we're still very active in the uh, passenger car segment as well. And to answer, sorry Peter, a little bit your question. There is another parameter in the equation which is obvious, but it's the cost. Mm. When you are speaking about the battery, it's, it's obvious, but it, but it, it still has to be highlighted water. because uh, yeah, it, it, that that drives a lot of the uh, of the decisions. The decisions yeah. are correct, and the battery is usually using uh, precious raw material that you are extracting from Earth. Can we imagine to have doesn't the enough fuel cell material for everybody in the world? I don't know, and for sure, a mix of all the solutions that we can have between edge to eyes fuel cell, bev electrical vehicles. See, the, depending on the final application, the final customer, it will have a kind of differentiation between all the, the different solutions that we may have. Yeah. yeah, I also like that message because on one hand, we haven't said r- really big bullshit in the last episode when we uh, discussed similar things that there is no silver bullet, basically, that, and you have to have the for specialized solution for, for every sure, application. Right. There's, a f- there's a famous saying used in the industry, we need all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yeah. haven't heard that yet, but uh, uh, apparently I haven't no. worked enough in uh, in English speaking. <laughs> no, in, uh, in, the, engineering in, the, in the hydrogen uh, world, uh, it's it's often uh, used, uh, and uh, I think it's very very true. There's applications out there which are suitable for Bev, and there's there are applications which are just not suitable. The, the if if you put that much battery into the vehicle, then it doesn't do its job anymore because it just became too bulky, uh, yeah, too heavy, yes. um, and too costly, as uh, Nathaniel mm-hmm. was saying. Exactly. Yeah. And back to your previous point that uh, you mentioned that batteries are using a lot of precious materials, which uh, 
can be a bad thing, but isn't it the same with uh, fuel cells? Fuel cell also contains some really Atinium, rare. Yes, yes, you have some some precious material like the used for the catalyst in a in a fuel cell stack for sure. That's one of the current issues mm. that we may have at the moment, but everybody is working to improve that to use mm. less and less platinum uh, in the in the future fuel cell uh, yeah. development and stack system that you you will find in the streets later. Yeah. But the re- recycling and design for recycling is a big topic in mm. our industry. So uh, as we progress towards the designs that are going to be on the streets in 2030, we have to design for recycling. Um, so the platinum that comes in to a, a fuel cell uh, isn't isn't new platinum that's just been mined somewhere. So it's, it's already recycling is is already so uh, there's a lot the, of platinum in already in exhaust systems, yes, in uh, internal definitely. combustion engine cars, and and this platinum and the other precious metals are already being recycled to uh, actually uh, manage the cost in the uh, yeah. in the industry. I heard an argument. Uh, some time ago when somebody said that yeah but uh, uh, internal combustion engine hydrogen solutions are better than fuel cells because you don't need to have precious materials like titanium for the fuel cell and the counter argument was that yeah but you need to have it in the catalyst anyway so <laughs> yes, that's a different story in that case you are also competing with the efficiency of the system itself Peter was presenting H2 fuel cell he spoke a little bit on H- H- H2I but the efficiency is, the max efficiency is not locating at the same operating point and we are not speaking at the same level yeah. uh, fuel yes. cell efficiency yeah. max at the moment everything is moving every day but we are close to 50 for the stack it's for the system itself 50% 55% so okay. system efficiency Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, H2 I, so uh, you were in Vienna a few days ago. You are about fifty percent also, but that's a uh, very that, new. That, that's a very maximum. Yeah. So that's that's, that's the in, in you are closer to forty percent uh, than fifty percent. Yeah. So, so the, the reality would be more uh, so close to forty percent. Yeah. I, I think this is an interesting point. If if your main um, concern is efficient use of hydrogen, then you would choose fuel cell. Yes. For the vast majority of applications. If you want to encourage, create a market where hydrogen is available, actually probably for some people the, the shortest and the quickest route to market is H2 ice. So if you wanted to put some stability in the supply <coughs> chain, H2 ice is not a bad uh, solution. So as, a, as a transitional way, and, it, it could and maybe... And from a cost perspective, it's I mean, wonderful because we have factories all over Europe which are ready to make engines <laughs> <laughs> to, to use h 2 ice. This is already capitally invested. So yes. uh, here in Hungary... Uh, you, you also have, to refer you back again planted. from previous episode, one of our guests, Nimrod, uh, told us that he's he and his company is experimenting with retrofitting uh, ship marine engines. So in, in our terms, 50,000 turbos a day, it's not big volume, but I think there is going to be a big retrofit uh, industry. Uh, I think people, com- transportation companies who want to lower their carbon footprint, <laughs> they will be looking at taking a diesel out, which is five years old, ten years old, refurbishing it and replacing it with a hydrogen uh, retrofit especially i mean (laughs) marine applications it's going to be very interesting because there the the life cycles are completely different uh, of the of the machines and uh, i mean of course retrofitting a a ship with a different propulsion system wouldn't really be uh, viable but but if you can use the existing uh, architecture of the of the ship yeah so 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 then we've got the picture of the ship and there's there's two types of load on a ship there's the propulsion load, uh, which, of course, you can go to electric propulsion, but yeah. there's also this thing called the hotel uh, load. So the, just because the ship is uh, in the port doesn't mean to say it's using zero en- energy. We uh, have, so the lights have true. to be on, the yes. galleys have to be on, uh, everything has to work. And and these ships burn megawatts of electricity when they're not moving. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you think about it being three... three hundred ships are basically a floating meters. small village. Yeah. Exa- it, uh, at least... Uh, Luxury hotel on, yeah. on the sea. Yes. Definitely. I mean, th- if you think about it, it's 300 odd meters long and then yes. it's uh, 20 odd stories high. Just to give you a rough number, it's more than 
20,000 liter per day. <laughs> Diesel per day. Yeah. Just for That's the other load yeah. to uh, so, so we work supply on electricity. On, um, some of our activities on hydrogen fuel cell are to do with uh, um, either putting them into uh, light commercial vehicles, into mach farm machinery, etc. But we also work on um, shipping um, projects, hotel loads primarily, mm -hmm. some s propulsion for smaller vessels. But there we're talking about megawatt scale. Already, yes. We will be working with uh, much smaller individual stacks, but then in a very modular form, you build up from, I'll just give you an example, 100 kilowatt, 10 100 kilowatt stacks equals... Uh, uh, one megawatt. Yes. <laughs> you know, so uh, that's... that's it, it adds up quickly. Uh, sorry. Yes. Uh, scratch that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th I think I got my maths wrong. Uh, this, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, okay. That, but, I, I also noticed this, but I was you, like, you, can, you, you, have, can, you have the, the uh, you can over 30 years of, uh, <laughs> of experience. Maybe I'm not going to uh, uh, and, stop and, you there. And maybe one last point. Uh, we are comparing two different technologies. Ice, I would mm, not yes. say H2 ice, but ice, which is almost 120, 130 years old, with a fuel cell, which is, uh, Peter, as you said, <laughs> maybe <laughs> for the very first <laughs> step, yeah, a few, a few uh, it maybe more or less 100 years, but uh, really in bigger development in the 60s, yep. 70s. And there, are, there, are still, there is still a lot to do on the fuel cell with a lot of challenges to face with at yes. the moment management, mm -hmm. uh, water management, lifetime. There's a lot still to be learned. Pollution that would yeah. Be, yeah. Everybody's working on that, but this is still, I think, limiting a little mm -hmm. bit the, the, the spread of this technology. And once again, h 2 ice can be a good intermediate solution uh, when the fuel cell technology will be widespread uh, in many, many applications. Definitely. When speaking of, of fuel cell technology, uh, I think we can sort of deep, uh, dive a little bit deeper uh, in that area, um, I would say. Um, are there different types of fuel cells that are used for, for uh, vehicle propulsion, or is just the whole thing kind of a same technology uh, applied in different scales? If we are looking at the fuel cell technologies, in general, we have mainly four or five big families that you yeah, have on, the, on the screen. Shows on the chart, yes. The, the main two ones are what we call the SOFC, solid oxide fuel cell, the first one at the, at the top. Yes. And the last one, the, the, the PEMS fuel cell, proto elect, uh, electron membrane. Proton, proto I, I guess. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> proton exchange, exchange membrane. membrane. There we go. Fuel yes. cell. Uh, uh, and this last technology is, the, is leading the automotive industry uh, at the moment because it allows to have a quick startup and a high power density. And in the middle, you have other family, uh, MFFC, uh, which uh, PAFC or DMFC, uh, which is mainly depending on the, 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 the intermediate uh, layer that you are using with, uh, with carbonate, uh, uh, phosphoric acid, or, uh, or, or burning alcohol and, uh, and, and direct methanol. So I don't want to speak uh, about this one, which but the, but the exotic, basic, but, but the basic but difference, the differentiating basic factor is sort of in the chemistry somewhere? In the uh, chemistry, yeah. yes. in the intermediate membrane or, or layer that you have okay. in the middle, and mainly the temperature that, uh, that the system is working at. Uh, so you see it's a uh, high temperature of fuel cell running between 800 and 1000 degrees which is That's very it. useful for power generation yeah. or, or stationary applications yeah, stationary application yeah. with uh, with big system but obviously it's not possible for uh, for, for automotive and everybody is now focusing on the uh, um, PEM, uh, PEM FC uh, uh, using uh, 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 a nafion membrane in the middle to separate the oxygen uh, side and the, the, the hydrogen side on the on the anode with the drawback of running at lower, far lower temperature <laughs> between 60, 80 degrees and with uh, a, a lot of challenging due to that low temperature, working temperature uh, with the heat, heat management I was, I was quoting a few minutes ago. Yeah, I mean, that has to be maintained uh, uh, yes. on an automotive yes, yes. scale. But actually, that, that sort of temperature is 
It's kind of similar to what a what an operating temperature of a of an ICE would be. I mean, it's a bit lower, but no, it's uh, a, or it's it's a, it's a different in, challenge. In, I, in I the can, vehicle I can sense. world, it's significantly lower because you would allow the water system of an ICE to drift up to one twenty degrees. That's true. That's true. Oh, in and the modern engines, yes. And then you reject in heat to in a in a hot country forty five fifty yes. degrees in a very hot country. Um, here, here the deltas we're are much different. With yeah. very small. Uh, delta T's, so yes. but it's similar uh, like the battery electric vehicles. Yes, yes. So I think some of them will be drifting up now to ninety degrees, but exchanging heat from ninety to fifty is a lot more difficult mm -hmm. than exchanging from one twenty to fifty. Just think yes. of the radius. Yeah, true. Size. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and in terms of engineering value, we were speaking about fifty percent efficiency for the for the PEM fuel cell. That means we are generating fifty percent of heat that you need mm -hmm. to extract. Yeah. The cooling circuit is the only way to extract yes. that heat. For H2I, or for a combustion engine, you can extract from oil or water, but also from the exhaust gases that you don't have with a fuel cell. Exactly, that's so that's a very important the, point. And, and, and so that's the range so between the, the two systems. So two we're, do, we're dealing with two things here. We've got no delta T, and, and we've no actually exhaust. got more heat going to the water than in yeah. an internal combustion engine because some of it's going down the exhaust in the internal combustion, which is quite a it, quite a lot of it actually. We, we, well, well, yeah, which is what we live on as turbocharger <laughs> engineers because that's what we want to harvest exactly. as uh, as the exhaust energy. But in the case of a fuel cell um, uh, stack, uh, most of the rejected heat is going to the to into the water system. And the vehicle manufacturers have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. When we look at, at Garrett's uh, uh, sort of business model in uh, in the in the uh, fuel cell world, uh, are you supply you're supplying the uh, compressors uh, that are required to uh, to channel uh, oxygen to the uh, to the system, right? Yeah. So we're we're providing the air. So we yeah. we don't just pump oxygen; it's oxygen and nitrogen. But we we're, we're pumping. Uh, that into uh, the fuel cell, and um, quite often it's it's like an internal combustion engine. Is uh, they you get to higher power densities if you if you pump more air and uh, higher pressure ratios. So you you there are limits, of course, um, but uh, we're we're always providing we provide the oxygen. Uh, uh, to actually react with the, it never uh, occurred to me that technically to, to the hydrogen, that technically the the fuel cell vehicles are also turbocharged, uh, <laughs> it's, so it's to speak. Essenti yeah. Essentially, they are. They uh, need the a majority of folks again with yeah. high pressure. So the majority of the work that we do on the compressor is supplied by an electric motor, a high speed electric motor, and in some applications, we're able to put a cold temperature turbine onto the other end of the machine really? and recover a few kilowatts. Uh, okay. but, uh, it's not the same order oh. of magnitude as a, in a turbocharged yeah. uh, system. You mentioned earlier that lifetime is also a development area in fuel cells, mm. but how do fuel cells age at all? Because it's a stationary thing with no mo moving parts, basically. So what causes a fuel cell to age? Okay, so so there's there's some chemical things going on all the, all the time. So mm. uh, there are there's chemistry in there which actually absorb pollutants over the lifetime of the uh, uh, of the usage, and there's other degradating effects which mm. are taking place. So a fuel cell does age. Um, we have to reckon with what will the output be at the end of life, and w we have to load the uh, uh, the fuel cell with the right concentrations of the precious metals, mm -hmm. etc., to get it to the specification mm -hmm. at the end of life. Or well, maybe just another point is the hydrogen purity and quality that you need to have mm -hmm. with a fuel cell. That's what I was going to ask. Is it the air or is it the hydrogen that's, the hydrogen that's more, uh, yeah. more, more well, uh, both, both both determined? To, to be honest, yeah. it's both. both. Uh, okay. the, the air in our cities is not perfectly clean. So, <laughs> so, so there Very are true. companies that specialize in uh, air filtration for fuel cells. Uh, they, mm -hmm. they strip the air of the things that would damage uh, the fuel cell. And like uh, Nathaniel said, uh, you need good quality, uh, very mm -hmm. good quality hydrogen to put into the fuel cell so it doesn't uh, kill the catalytic sites within the, the membrane. 
I see. And what is the expected life lifetime of a fuel cell today? Well, it depends on the <laughs> expected <laughs> life of the application. So mm. in typically in a passenger car, I mean, we're talking about, uh, shall we say, more than 250,000 kilometers, mm. but less than 500. And in a truck, we're talking mm. more than a million, but less than two million or mm. maybe two and a half million. But, you know, so it's, it's application um, specific. So this is also dependent on uh, on mileage. I mean, this might sound like a stupid question, but uh, but I was also thinking that th- since there are uh, catalysts and and chemical reactions uh, going on here, uh, I wasn't sure if this is going to depend on the on the amount of usage that the fuel cell gets, or it depends on time as well, maybe. So there's always the two criteria. Yep. It's um, it's like any warranty <laughs> you would hope to get with a Five ve- years or vehicle. It comes with a time duration and a mileage yeah. uh, duration. So obviously when you're in the heavy duty domain, uh, I think the, uh, the kilometers uh, clock up. Uh, much quicker than the actual <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. uh, the time, but uh, if well, you in the passenger might, market, uh, in it, it it might be. I uh, mean, the you, other way around. We we talk about fifteen year mm. useful life in most markets. That's yeah. That's probably uh, more than sufficient. Also, there is uh, what we mentioned is, is quick startup for the fuel cell for the pump fuel cell. The pump fuel cell is super sensitive to how many times you are going to stop it and uh, ask power to it in a short mm-hmm. time. So it wouldn't really be suited it's for... It's like switching a light. Time. It's, okay. it's, it's not depending how long you are going to, mm-hmm. to use it. It's when you switch it off, switch it on, switch it off, switch it on. And the more you are doing that, the lower will be the, the, the lifetime of the of the pen. Okay. That also sh- suggests that it's more suitable for heavy duty applications. For constant, yes. constant load. Yes. Yeah. yeah. When you design a fuel cell vehicle, you you design it as either a fuel cell dominant vehicle or a range extended uh, vehicle Mm. or or something in the middle, yeah. So a a fuel cell dominant vehicle, most of the power that the vehicle needs will be coming directly live from the fuel cell. So it will go through many, many cycles, yeah. Whereas you go for a range extended vehicle, then you probably take it carrying more battery with you, but the the range extended fuel cell is on virtually all the time, mm-hmm. just as a generator, and it's constantly charging the batteries, as it were. So you you have choices, and uh, constructors are making those choices every day as to what USPs they want to sell in their particular vehicles. And do you see vehicles coming solely depending on a fuel cell without an auxiliary battery? To no. No, I mean, every, every vehicle will have a battery. The question is, how big is the battery? Mm. The, the the batteries on a fuel cell dominant vehicle are quite small, mm. but on a, a balanced or a range extended uh, vehicle, they can be quite large batteries. Mm. Great. In the meantime, I have... Uh Run through a little bit of the of the presentation because I think mm-hmm. uh, what's what's still important to mention is the the scalability of uh, of fuel cells and and how that mm-hmm. works because um, technically what 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 is in a what ends up in a vehicle is not just a single cell but it is a stack of cells. Am I correct? Mm-mm. Are there limitations in in, in regards to to stacking uh, uh, fuel cells? There are. Um, it's it's perhaps not our main area of expertise, but <coughs> each one of those cells, uh, you can think of it as a, um, a kind of a small battery, yeah, with with a yeah. certain voltage for a single cell. I see. Yeah. Yeah. And if you build them up in series, then eventually, if you have fo- if each one of them is one volt, and you you have four hundred of them, then you get yeah, to four hundred volts in in series. Yeah. And then they're stacked like that, but they're held together, basically, they're clamped together by two very large, rigid uh, end plates, and they're bolted through so that you can press it all together and you maintain uh, it as a... Um, as a unit, a as single a, as, unit. As a unit which can hold the pressure that the compressor's going to put, <laughs> put in there. Yeah. So there are limits. There's mechanical limits as to yep. uh, the tolerancing mm-hmm. uh, because you've got to build this sandwich up. Yep. Um, so there's a few limits, and typically your most fuel cell stacks are in the region of 300 to 400 uh, cells in height. They're clamped together, and one stack will, will come in at a 
typically in sizes of 50 kilowatt or 100 kilowatt or two, maybe some of the bigger ones are 200 kilowatts depending on the surface yep. area, etc. And then if you want to go to higher powers than that, you, you have multiple stacks and mm -hmm. you, you build out the modularity that way. And in terms of serviceability, uh, are the individual cells interchange exchangeable if if I, one I think with the correct fail, manufacturing or? process, yes. In okay. your in your garage at home, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we wouldn't recommend that for sure. <laughs> that's that's definitely true. You already mentioned, uh, uh, Peter, the 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 pressure of of the of the um, gases that go through the uh, mm -hmm. um, go through the system. Um, Nathaniel, this might be directed more to your uh, direction. Mm -hmm. um, what are the similarities and the differences in the challenges of, of describe or, or, or um, developing a, a compressor application for uh, for a fuel cell compared to ice? So multiple, as Peter said a little bit, a bit, a little bit at the beginning of the presentation, there are different topologies. So different on the flow you would like to target, depending on the, the pressure you would like to reach, depending on the stacks uh, uh, features. Uh, you will select different topologies. It could be a, a, a compressor, a fuel cell compressor with a single compressor wheel, for instance, yep. very close to what you are with in a conventional turbocharger on the compressor side only. Yeah. I'm not or speaking about. Is it similar to an uh, e-turbo or an, like an e-compressor? E uh, more an e-compressor. Yeah. More an e-compressor. It's driven by an e-motor, yeah. high-speed e-motor, with a single compressor. Okay. If you need to reach a higher boost pressure, you can have compressor on each side of the e-motor okay. in series to reach higher boost pressure. I see. More or less the same flow. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is quite good, but if you want to optimize the efficiency of the system itself, we are speaking about stack, but we have to consider the, the fuel cell as a whole, the stack, which is generating electricity, but also the auxiliaries, which are consuming electricity, like the fuel cell <laughs> compressor. Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, that that's mm -hmm. also uh, that that takes actual power from the from the, like this is not no. necessarily run by yes. sort of waste energy as 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 you would, yeah, you would do you on, the, really on the on the on the on the ice. But this, this is, is the difference definitely taking between power what out. we call the gross and the net power of the stack. Yeah. If you want to optimize the efficiency of the system, you could you can use what we call an that's expander, the, which so is the gross a power is the total output power of the stack. Yes. And yes. the net power is yes is the useful that the gross power minus what is consumed by the auxiliary. I see. What you will use at the end is the net power. Yeah. What is available exactly. is the net power. Yeah. So to come back to the system efficiency, I was saying you, there is a single compressor system, dual compressor system if you need more boost. But if you want to optimize the system in terms of efficiency, you can add uh, uh, what we call an expander or a turbine instead of the second compressor wheel. You yeah. still have one compressor on one side of the motor. You will have an expander on the other side to recover energy from the l water, steam and liquid water and air that you have at the exhaust pipe of the stack. It's, not, mm. it's not a big, but, but it's still energy. It's still energy that you can recover on the mm -hmm. shaft to limit the energy consumption from the e-motor. So this is the third topology. And the last one, I don't know if you if you well, added. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if we have uh, it's slides. I mean, directly we here we are. One, one more, I think. When we go one more, yeah, yes. yes. We go. Okay, so there, the, there the are first the topologies. One at yeah, the, at, the, at the bottom right. If all of the system are not capable to reach the the targeting point, what you can do is to use a modular approach with one of the system that you have, but doubling it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Two compressor here. You have two e motors and uh, and uh, and, and four two double compressors. compressors yeah, two double compressor, four impellers in total in the system to reach. But it's the possible to input. to duplicate any of the uh, other yeah, uh, solutions it, if, it you, is, if, it you, if you would, if you wanted to. It is. It's not very useful, but <laughs> <laughs> not, useful. not. I mean, you could, you could, you could, but them are useful. <laughs> but what we are used to see very often is the last one with uh, with two e motors yeah. and two compressors on the. I side mean, if side. the ultimate goal is uh, is to reach a higher pressure, then yes, that's. Uh, yes, I mean, yes. you, you need to yeah. invest the power there. So I mean, if if I can characterize this, um, the number one top so the, left the compressor would only? be typical light duty van. Okay. Uh, number two might be heavy duty on-road truck. That's the compressor and the turbine yeah. uh, together? Um, 
Number three was actually our first launch with Honda. Really? The, the Honda Clarity was a, num- was a two compressor uh, configuration. They loved the high pressure ratio and ma- wide map width. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that was required... I assume because of the higher power requirements from uh, so they had for for acceleration performance, or performance, uh, yeah, ta- targets which required map width and uh, pressure ratio. We actually use the pressure ratio to manage humidity in the stack. So there's the regular operating points, but then there's uh, humidifying operating <laughs> points or blow through purge operating mm-hmm. points, which you, you need. And it gave them all the flexibility that they needed um, to, to operate their stack. And the bottom uh, right there would be the typical marine yeah, uh, the configuration. double compressors, that's yeah. uh, Where the two double compressors. The automotive machines that we have at the moment just aren't big enough. Yeah. So we need to. Yeah. <laughs> but is it the same? Is it the same automotive uh, system that is used uh, for marine applications, but just so doubled? Or the base machine is uh, is very similar. Okay. Um, there are added durability requirements mm-hmm. and uh, a, sh- a sh- for instance, a ship uh, tilts and pitches. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, to so the operating conditions can be higher a bit operating angles than a yeah. than a truck. 15 degrees in all directions is normal for an on-road vehicle. 22 and a half degrees mm-hmm. in all directions is normal for a ship. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How much those solutions are different from your uh, normal internal combustion engine uh, turbos and compressors? Oh. So um, which are the main design challenges? So, so, so in different? terms of um, physical parts, there's... Really, only the aerodynamics, which could be considered to be common. Well, um, I see. In terms of technology, so if you if you back it out and say, do we have the uh, uh, motor technology? Do we have the inverter technology? Uh, the the actual competencies within the company. How how do they compare with an e turbo or an e compressor for an automotive application? Uh, then I would say they're the same. Mm-hmm. Es- essentially, but the actual detailed designs are, are quite different. Um, we do uh, do modular inverters, so we're not just a mechanical company anymore. We, we design our own uh, power electronics. We've brought this in over the last uh, five, seven years. Mm-hmm. Uh, we design all our own software uh, mm-hmm. that operates the uh, machines, and these are highly modularized. So actually, there is... There would, at the inverter level at least, there would be some commonality between fuel cell compressors and large e turbos for internal combustion engines. That, interesting. That type of thing. Very interesting. And and one of the biggest challenges that we had to face with, compared with a conventional turbocharger using journal bearing, lubrica- lubricated oh, yeah. by oil, yes, is the air bearing solution. Uh, 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 that we are using for uh, for uh, for this kind of, of compressor. So we do I understand correctly no that, that there's technology tr- transfer from fuel cell towards uh, ice? Is that correct in understanding, it's or or is it just no, no. not really? The, yeah. I mean, we we have run um, internal combustion turbochargers on airfoil bearings, okay, mm-hmm. and they work. Um, are they the most adapted solution for an internal combustion engine? Perhaps not. I see. Um, but uh, they work very, very well in the fuel cell um, area. And they have this um, key um, uh, characteristic that there is zero oil, which mm-hmm. would ultimately poison the fuel cell stack if if there was uh, oil in the air that we were providing to them. To the um, mm-hmm. uh, to the fuel cell, so uh, we have to use them in um, uh, in fuel cell uh, technology, and uh, they run on this principle that they really they generate their own lift. So, I see. Okay. So we we use the principle of air foil um, bearings. They generate their own lift. We have to pl- pass a small amount of air through them in order to cool them, um, yeah. but actually. We have this concept of takeoff and landing mm. uh, for, for for the machine, and in in the, in in the middle we're in flight, 
and there's no contact between the bearing and the I see. and the housing. And so I assume that this is also more suited for uh, these constant applications. Uh, so the, um, we we have an idle speed that we need yeah. to respect, and then above that we can modulate to between okay. maximum speed and the idle speed. Um, but uh, yes, we we prefer to keep them flying <laughs> rather than land them and. Uh, um, and I guess it doesn't do much good for the uh, lifetime of the uh, well. Uh, I mean, the, the bearing itself. They, they're designed for purpose. They will yeah. meet the requirements, Definitely. but uh, yeah, the fewer takeoff and landings you do, the better. Great. I think that kind of leads us towards uh, a short discussion on uh, on H two ice because we haven't really touched upon that sure. that that topic yet. Um, is H two ice only uh, convenient because there's so many? Uh, vehicles already uh, on on the roads with with combustion engines, and they could be uh, um, sort of um, transformed into uh, using uh, H2. Or um, is there another reason why uh, this is an attractive solution? That is certainly one reason. <laughs> um, I would argue that at rated power, H2 ice actually looks very good in efficiency yep. ag- against uh, the alternatives. Um, so if you if you have a machine which is working um, 24-7 at high load, then H2 ICE is a, is a very good solution. Um, the other thing is when the fuel has to come to the machine. As, as, the, as you've mentioned before. And the machine fundamentally isn't a high-speed machine. It yep. doesn't move. Then how do you cool it? So... If you if you're bringing the hydrogen to the machine, you could use a fuel cell or you could use uh, an ICE. But if the machine's duty is for it to stay in one place and to dig dirt or to uh, uh, move an item from A to B, and its maximum speed is five kilometers per hour, how are you going to cool it when it's actually working <laughs> at high load? Then H two ice is a lot easier to achieve than uh, than a fuel cell. Than the fuel cell, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I never thought that that the cooling would be uh, such a big uh, big topic in the in the in the fuel yes. cell. But it but it, it, <laughs> it sounds like that is one of the one of the one of the key key uh, reasons for headaches in terms of the uh, engineering development of uh, of fuel cells. David, do you have any more questions for, or do you have any questions for the for the IC applications? I'm also surprised that uh, one of the benefit of the IC solution is that uh, the better ability to cool it. But yeah, it's it will be interesting to see in the future that how these technologies are actually yeah, going to be on the market. A lot of people are working on edge to ice yeah. uh, topic yeah. at the moment. Uh, once again, in Vienna, you saw a lot of presentation. Uh, there were there were two full sessions on edge to ice oh. in uh, Vienna uh, recently. The UN and the European Union have. Uh, yeah. At least cleared the pathways leg- yeah. for legislation to allow H two ice as uh, zero CO two and in certain cases uh, quasi zero emission or zero impact uh, emission as we uh, term it in the industry. It was a really uh, popular topic back in the IA last year as well in in Hanover. Indeed, indeed. Um, and uh, also, I'm quite happy to see that uh, even though in the mainstream media maybe the battery electric vehicles are are the holy grail of the uh, carbon free uh, uh, transportation of the future, but the industry is still investigating other areas, and mm. we will have other solutions. And no, and, and we indeed need the the whole spectrum. Yeah, maybe a little controversial, but um, we we mustn't only s- focus on the in use carbon footprint. Exactly, of, that of is really all important. Solutions, increasingly, the industry turns itself to try and get get a meaningful understanding of life cycle analysis. Yeah. Yes, which includes the manufacturing carbon footprint and. Really, if we want to compare all of these competing technologies, then we should uh, bring the three use faces of uh, a vehicle yes. onto the table at the same time. So manufacturing, which includes the mining of the raw materials. Yeah. Um, the use phase, which is normally just fueling your car or, or plugging it in, wh- yes. whatever it is. And then the recycling, recycling. phase. Exactly. And the recycling is normally a much smaller element than the uh, use and the uh, manufacturing. But 
I mean, especially the in the case of the manufacturing phase is super important. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, but also recycling. And actually, between the mining and the manufacturing, the transportation of the raw materials mm-hmm. around so the globe and th- things that's like in, that. So that's included in this in this yes, manu- in the supply chain for manufacture, and that's what companies are going through now in order to actually start reporting all of these values. Um, and in the future, by the time we get to twenty thirty. Um, Anybody involved in the the, the industry, we're, we're already starting, but there'll be firm systems set in place that we can actually uh, report these numbers, and we'll we'll see which are the most efficient. And and that that is the same for the hydrogen. That's for what I was going to. That's what that's oh, what yeah. I was going to yeah, ask because colors for the hydrogen. <laughs> <and> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I, the I've the I've heard of these colors and the blue and hydrogen, the, hydrogen, the pink and and the green oh. one. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the hydrogen with the different colors. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Like two, like, 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 like two weeks ago, yeah, the uh, the rainbow of hydrogen. But uh, <laughs> yes, the rainbow. Um, let's let's hope that the uh, um, sort of. I, I mean, I cannot even see green, greener because yeah. not, not ne- green doesn't necessarily mean the best for the environment. No, but but uh, have a in, in all seriousness, yeah. I mean, um, windmills are not zero CO2. Yeah. Uh, nuclear plants are not zero CO2. Yes. But at this stage of the, the economy's um, sophistication, that some of these things are counted as zero. But by the time we get to 2030, they're not going to be counted as zero. So we'll see a clearer picture uh, mm-hmm. emerge over the coming years. Yeah, I yeah think. but these pictures are extremely complicated and it's very Absolutely. hard to take a yeah. with yeah. everything. Yes. Yes. I mean, you have to really go away from just a vehicle observation and you have to start thinking of, of its full cycle from mm-hmm. really from cradle to grave. Uh, and that is, uh, I think... Um, not just the industry, but also customers need to be made made uh, very well aware of that uh, of those facts because uh, then their purchase decisions uh, might be uh, influenced by them as well. So that's no, I, th- a huge, huge I think challenge. everybody needs to be well informed, and yes. uh, yeah, the headlines don't always carry the full story. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that's also yes. that's also a great message to uh, uh, to sort of turn towards the end of our um, uh, end of our session uh, but uh, before we really wrap it up uh, I think uh, we need to talk about uh, a bit more of our uh, collaboration uh, between Garrett and our okay, association sure. yeah. uh, because there's it's it doesn't end with this podcast uh, there will be more to come in the future uh, specifically at Formula Student yeah. 2023. Of course I'm very happy to have you here guys and actually we are I think very glad that you have traveled to Budapest just because of this afternoon to record this podcast and I hope you are going to enjoy the city as well a little bit <laughs> and uh, I'm also proud of that Garat is the first company to to support us organizing for most student, student East mm-hmm. who is actually not present in Hungary in its uh, with its locations at all he, and uh, you have reached out to us uh, uh, as a foreign company and uh, told us that you like our our competition in Hungary, and you heard that teams are like our competition in Hungary, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we created an agreement, and I hope that this is indeed a beginning of a beautiful friendship between us, and I'm also hope that we we could record our first English podcast with you, uh, warming up your presence at Hungaroring in in August. Wow. Okay. So we we will. Um uh, we're we're very excited with the with the partnership. Obviously, we have our own objectives with this as well. We love the comp- as you should. We love mm. the competition formula. Student uh, it encourages and it motivates students uh, all around the uh, globe. So um, we've we've seen the results in other locations. We're very happy to be uh, uh, involved with you guys with Formula Student uh, East. Um, this year we started a very exciting program where we've started to bring uh, students into our facility in Brno in the Czech Republic, um, and they're working on the high speed motors of the future. Yeah. So uh, here's somewhere along the line, we want to help you uh, uh, obviously uh, be competitive in your race. Um, But on the other hand, uh, we want to see uh, some of the energy and some of the talent uh, uh, that comes through your student ranks uh, maybe gravitating in our direction. And uh, uh, One day we're going to be hosting uh, Hungarian students in uh, in, uh, in Brno. That would be actually great. And I 
I do happy to hear that uh, uh, you are also recognizing our role uh, to to motivate the future generation and edu- educate them uh, to ab- absolutely to create I've what is going I've to be. I've seen this roads. firsthand how it operates in the UK universities. Um, believe it or not, uh, it was around uh, <laughs> when I was an undergraduate <laughs> as well. Um, but whether you're in the UK, whether you're in the US, whether you're in Hungary, it, it acts as a um, uh, a real glue between the students and a motivator and uh, to anybody at who is out there uh, uh, and they can spare the time on top of their studies, it's it's a fantastic way to put into practice what you're mm-hmm. learning and what you're experiencing at the universities. Well, you heard it from Peter, not from us. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a better message than, than anything that we could dream up. David. Definitely mark it in your CV if you're applied to Barat. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we are really looking forward to uh, to having you uh, at, at FS East in, in 2023. Are, are any of you going to be there in person? or I, do you, It's always sure? possible. We, 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 <laughs> we haven't booked our calendars uh, that far ahead yet, Great. but uh, certainly some of my colleagues are going to be that. Let's hope so. Then I'm sure Christy will be happy to have you as uh, engineering design event judges or something like this. Well, who knows? Yeah. Let's keep in contact until then honor. for sure. Yeah. yeah, we would be honored if you if, if, uh, if you were there, and and we are honored right now uh, for uh, for your uh, visit to our studio. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Uh, uh, very very much so, and uh, it fit perfectly with the schedule. I was. Uh, I was in Vienna last week. Uh, I stayed over, uh, had a wonderful weekend in uh, Vienna, and uh, I've come over here today. So it's been very easy for me. <laughs> for for Nathaniel, maybe not so much. <laughs> for me, uh, I woke up quite early, but that's okay. I really enjoyed the experience, and uh, thanks a lot. For yeah, welcome. Thank you very much for being the here. The pleasure is ours. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, thank you for all of our viewers who were who were with us. Uh, and uh, make sure to subscribe to our uh, to our podcast because we are going to be following this up with more English episodes to come. Yeah, if you are here uh, as a foreign listener, this is our first English episode, and you are not going to find much in the history of our podcast, which Unfortunately, is entertaining no. for you. But, but we can in promise fu- some in the future. Yeah, in the future, it will come. And guys, if if I may. Um, Your English is fantastic. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I I hear an accent, but I grammatically you're perfect. <laughs> thank you. Well, we are very very happy to hear that. I actually wanted to open with a funny story that I usually tell tell my friends who are a bit shy to speak English that if you are speaking English with somebody, that the chances are the other person not using English as a first language either. So yeah, so he is not going to point out that you are a little bit mistaky or not perfect with your grammar and yet here we are with our first English podcast with a very British man here <laughs> to, <laughs> to hear everything about our English. So so I'm one of the rare British people who speaks uh, two foreign languages at least. I speak French and German. <laughs> I learned very early on it's much more important to speak than to speak exactly. correctly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so definitely forget your one nerves. brings the other. I, ca- I, I would say, <laughs> <laughs> For, forget your nerves and jump in, and it w- it will bring dividend. Yeah, if you can communicate your ideas, yes, be abo- <laughs> beyond borders, then it's open up absolutely many, many doors. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I can only agree with that, and I think that's that's a wonderful way to 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 end the podcast. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for watching, uh, and see you again soon. Bye bye. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.